Hey, thanks for stopping by and, and uh, finding this video. Uh, my name is John Myers and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through a narrow band shooting sequence of the Eagle Nebula and the Pillars of Creation, which is a really cool nebula and it's probably one of the most famous out there. And um, if you look online and you look up the Pillars of Creation, you can see some really cool Hubble telescope shots of that. The Eagle Nebula is like really far out there and, and uh, it's, a, it's a relatively small nebula uh, depending on what scope you use. Uh, and in particular the Pillars of Creation are really small so um, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to shoot at 2350 millimeters through a schmidt cassegrain scope. It's a Celestron Edge HD uh, 9 and a quarter uh, inch uh, right here and it's uh, it's um, got an imaging train set up that we're going to walk through um, in a minute. I'm going to go ahead and uh, walk through the uh, the backyard here. I'll, I'll show you around a little bit and then we're going to ultimately we're going to go to this stuff and we're going to um, go through all the details of the mount and the uh, telescope and the setup that I have outside and that kind of thing. Uh, this is um, this video is for for beginners or advanced it doesn't matter. Um, it's just to show you um, some of the uh, some of the things that um, I do. I'm not a professional. This is all self-taught. Um, I've been into astrophotography for about three years now, and prior to that, I was into astronomy, and I, I studied it for years. And I had telescopes as a kid, uh, but we never had the technology and the software that we do now, and it was not affordable really um, for me. And I was into other stuff and different time in my life, so I really didn't uh, invest a, a whole lot in it until recently. Um, I did uh, have a couple of telescopes. Um, I never had a, a real big telescope. I think the biggest I had was about a five inch uh, Newtonian reflector. And uh, I wasn't happy with the clarity of the images that I was getting, and that was back in like 1997. Um, and then I, I built a telescope myself out of a, uh, a Cobra helicopter tow missile launcher. Um, I was around the military a lot, and we, uh, we were at a, the DRMO, which is where they scrap stuff. And uh, this was in Germany, and I found a, a six inch uh, tow telescope or tow missile launcher off, of, uh, off the uh, Cobra helicopter. Anyway, I used that, and then I, uh, I bought a, a, a lens kit a, or a mirror kit, which is two Pyrex glass blanks that you ultimately grind together with different grades of, of carbide and, and uh, aluminum oxide and, and, and grinding powders until you uh, get the parabola that you're looking for, and then you got to polish it and send it off to get uh, vaporized aluminum uh, coated on it. And uh, anyway, I assembled that thing, and it was really cool, but it didn't work very well. So. Uh, um, it was, uh, I didn't know enough, and, and but um, it did work, and um, I would say it, it wasn't a whole lot worse than, than some of the telescope that, that you would buy, um, you know, in a store, and so that was really cool. It was actually an accomplishment. I did have to buy the mount uh, for the mirror that adjusted it, and, you know, so you could collimate it, 
and then um, the eyepiece and, and, and stuff like that you had to buy but but grinding the mirror I think was the biggest challenge and, and the coolest part of the whole thing because you had to build up all the test equipment and stuff so that was that was cool and then um, ultimately I got into uh, about three years ago um, I was bored and I pulled out my 90 millimeter mead refractor and it's a thousand millimeter uh, telescope and I thought, you know, uh, I could probably put my DSLR camera on the mount and use my camera to take pictures of the stars and uh, the Milky Way and stuff like that. And so I did. I took the uh, telescope off the mount and then I mounted a rifle scope on the mount um, for a kind of a finder scope. And then what I did is I took the, uh, I took it outside and uh, it had a little clock drive on it, a little 24 hour clock drive and you could engage that thing and uh, once it was aligned on Polaris and then you could swing it around just like a telescope and and uh, you know use it the same way and so uh, what I did is I took it out and then I located where I thought Andromeda was and because I had such a wide angle lens I started I think it was a uh, hundred millimeters or something some, somewhere close to that and, and uh, so I aimed it up in the general direction of Andromeda and Lo and behold, I, I was taking like 30 second shots and boom, there it was, clear as day. And so, um, you know, with that, I took a whole bunch of pictures. I found out about the uh, software where you can stack images, Deep Sky Stacker. And uh, I did that and I was just, I, I got hooked right there. And, uh, and then I went from, the, uh, um, from that mount. I used that for a while. I actually... Um, Took quite a few shots of uh, Orion and Andromeda using that old mount, and then what I did is I transitioned to a Star Adventure, which I'll show you here in a second. And uh, I transitioned to a Star Adventure um, Pro, um, the, the Star Tracker that you could use with a DSLR camera as well. And then I went to uh, after that I transitioned to nicer lenses. This is a really nice 70 to 200 f 2.8. Uh, it's a VR2 ED, FL ED, uh, Nikon lens, 70 to 200 millimeters. And, um, and with this, I, I was getting excellent shots of Andromeda and Orion, full color images uh, that were amazing. Um, people couldn't believe it, at least people that don't know astrophotography, when they see what you can do with a DSLR, they, it blows their mind. It, it's like, wow, I thought I needed this giant telescope to do that. I said, no. I came out of my camera lens. Anyway, uh, from there, I jumped up to the 120 millimeter Skywatcher 120 ED uh, triplet APO, Pachromatic, and then I went from that. Or this is this is outfitted with the uh, 60 millimeter guide scope and an ASI 290 camera and a Prima Luce Sesto Senso uh, micro focuser. Um, that's a really nice setup. And then, of course, I've got the the, uh, the uh, Schmidt Casper in here, which I'll tell you about. Um, so that's basically it. Again, um, that's the equipment. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through it, and uh, then we'll go outside and we'll set up, and then we'll get deeper into the video. And as we get into the video, it's going to be a little bit boring uh, for some people, so uh, you can skip through it, uh, do whatever you want. There's a part two and a part part three. Part two. Well, part one will be this and the uh, the setup and the uh, pull alignment or puller alignment, and then after that um, we'll get into plate solving uh, in part two, and then a little bit about Stellarium, and uh, there's also some focus hints and things like that, that uh, an astrophotography tool that we'll be using. We'll also talk a little bit uh, about some guiding issues with a PhD two, and uh, some corrections that I have had to make uh, with software. I actually ended up fully upgrading all the software right in the middle of the shoot. Um, and then after that we'll get into part three. And part three is processing and I've actually uh, set up to do that. I've got the images that I want to use. We'll get into the processing in Photoshop. But we'll probably use uh, Photoshop and a little bit of Lightroom to do that. And I'll show you some some quick little things. Processing is, is really an art and it really depends on the person uh, and what, what programs they'd like to use and then how, they're, how they kind of sequence their processing steps. Um, I'm kind of all over the place. I just kind of play around and do what I think looks right. Um, and uh, other people are completely scientific about it. Um, and then there's some people that are completely scientific but don't know how to process and then the other way around. So uh, that's why you see such a mix of uh, images out there online. 
Um, anyway, that's it. Uh, we'll shut the video down here and then we'll pick up uh, walking around the equipment and uh, out in the back. So again, thanks for uh, stopping by and uh, thanks for finding the video and we'll, we'll get it going here. We'll just try to get it focused, um, which I always struggle with. But uh, anyway, so what we have here is, I'm gonna get my glasses so I can make sure we're focused. Um, this is, a, this is basically a 7200 uh, DSLR lens. This is a real nice Nikon lens. It's an f2.8. Uh, it's a full-size uh, professional lens, and it's got a little bit of beach sand in it. We just got back from a, a hurricane. Um, that we, we went surfing uh, last weekend. And uh, we're in Maryland, by the way, so uh, we drove down to Virginia and did that. But uh, anyway, I've got to clean this camera stuff up. But that, that's one of my uh, lenses that I use for... Uh, um, kind of wide field uh, at 200 millimeters um, and so you know there's some objects I started out with that and um, really before I bought uh, the Skywatcher 120 over there I was using a DSLR on this uh, Skywatcher Star Adventure this is an excellent thing to start out with I'm not going to go into detail but just to show you real quick this is the uh, Skywatcher Star Adventure um, and basically what it is, is it's kind of like, acts like a, a, a telescope mount. It's got right ascension that can be uh, set up with a guider uh, and a guide camera with a separate guide scope, um, similar to what's here on this 120. And uh, so I started out with that. And uh, it's got a little uh, polar alignment scope down inside. And uh, so you can check out the deal or the detail if you look up a Star Adventure from Skywatcher. I think iOptron has one. It's a, a Star Trek, or I don't know exactly what the name is. Um, anyway, then we've got the uh, William Optics. William Optics makes some really nice scopes. This is a GT71 Gran Turismo. It's got a built-in Batonoff mask uh, inside here, and then it's got an adjustable uh, dew cover, and uh, it's got a little carrying handle, and this is an excellent travel scope. And I bought this to, uh, to set up for uh, wide field, and it's got a one-shot color ASI 2600 um, full-color uh, astronomy camera there um, I've got an off axis guider sitting on it right now I, I'm, I've not really used it but uh, I may take that off axis guider and actually put it on the uh, 120 and then take the uh, guide scope that I started with on the 120 and put it on the GT71 uh, that'll, that'll mean I've got a OAG with the uh, with the 120 which will provide a little bit better tracking for that it's got good tracking anyway but uh, and I'm only shooting at 714 millimeters but because I had that it would, this is all trial and error. I, I was trying to get the imaging train on the schmidt Cassegrain uh, going, uh, but found out I had to get a little bit different setup for that, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, So anyway, what I ended up with is I ended up with a video camera I can use for planetary. I ended up with uh, a, uh, uh, another guide scope that I'll swap over to this, and then I'll take that OAG and swap it back over to the APO or the uh, 120, and uh, then all of these will uh, provide you know different levels of... Uh, wide field all the way up to uh, long focal length astrophotography. So this is a Celestron Edge uh, HD uh, 9 and a quarter. We're going to be using this to shoot the Eagle Nebula. Uh, it does a real nice job with the uh, ASI 1600 for picking up uh, a good enough frame uh, to where it makes a, a nice combination of the pillars of creation and a little bit of surrounding nebula. So real nice combination. And then the, the big key to this, and I'll walk through it in more detail out there, is this imaging train. This is a, a great imaging train. It's an Azato uh, microfocuser coupled with a Celestron OAG and an ASI-174 uh, mono uh, guide camera. And then on the back, I swapped out the, uh, I had an ASI-1600 on here thinking I'd go full color. But once I, uh, once I did a little practice and, and uh, really understood uh, a little bit more, I, I went ahead and said, you know what, I'm going to put the uh, filter wheel on here and I'm going to stick the, the, the ASI 1600 monochrome camera on here and I'm going to go for deep in uh, nebula shots like Pillars of Creation and the Bubble, bubble Nebula and, and uh, some things like that. So anyway, that's the equipment. Uh, real quick walk around the room here. Um, I've just, this, is, this is my basement and uh, it's just kind of the hangout, you know, so I've got some cabinets that are full of like astronomy equipment and stuff like that and then i've got some workstations and editing 
stuff over here. I use the uh, I use a flat screen uh, TV. It's connected to the computer. Um, I can use that. I don't know what's going on with the focus, but hopefully you can see it. And uh, I've got various uh, computers for different things. So there's a lot of where I do the uh, processing. And, and then I've got some other stuff down here. It's just basically storage boxes and telescope boxes. And then over here we have a kind of a, a little workout area. And uh, we've got all my surfboards up here on the ceiling. Uh, that's one of my other hobbies. I, uh, I surf. I've been surfing since I was a kid. I still do it. I'm 56 now. And uh, we just uh, went to uh, Virginia Beach last weekend. And uh, Hurricane Sam was here. It's, uh, that was October 2nd. And then, uh, you know, try to keep from drowning. So uh, we try to do a little bit here in terms of staying in shape. And then um, the other hobbies I have are cars and airplanes. And if you visit uh, pixelsite.org, um, that's my website. Again, pixelsite, P I X E L uh, dot O R or pixelsite, S I G H T. Um, I'll have it on the screen. You can you can uh, follow that. But anyway, that's that's where I'd have my astrophotography, my uh, regular photography, and then uh, I've got a car build site where I built a uh, factory five GTM. Um, and then I've got a airplane build site where I built a uh, full size uh, aircraft. Um, my profession is aircraft. Um, I was in aircraft maintenance for a long time, and then I got into engineering and ultimately into program management. And now I'm a program manager for uh, about 700 aircraft, and so that's my real job. Uh, but I do uh, this. I do paragliding, ham radio. Um, I'm an artist. I do oil painting and watercolor painting, photography, astrophotography, surfing, and some other things. So. Um, you can see some of that there on the site. Um, I'll show you the outside in the other video, but I'm going to go ahead and I'll leave this where I'm at. You can see all the winter plants in here. Uh, they're winter plants now. They used to be outside. They're actually palm trees and banana trees and stuff like that. Um, and uh, anyway, I'll show you outside in the, uh, in the next clip, and I'm going to shut this one off now. Okay, take two. Uh, this is the observatory out here in the backyard and I'm set up by the pool which is you know really fortunate to, to be able to come out here and do this and uh, we just pulled the plants in uh, you probably saw them when I was walking out of the basement there and uh, but it's a beautiful time of the year to do astrophotography and as you can see we have a nice clear night or evening and the sun's going down over there and then we've got Moose, who is my company out here in the middle of the night. He'll start bringing us toys here pretty soon. Hey, Moose, what's going on? Huh? What are you doing, man? Oh, hey. Yeah, he gets really dark at night. You can't see him. He'll be laying right here and just trip on him. All right. So this is the Edge uh, 9 and a quarter HD. Yeah, on a Skywatcher EQ6R mount and we've got it sitting on the dolly that I manufactured and uh, I'll tell you with with the dolly the nice thing about it if you have a place to roll it out of like from your basement to your to some kind of pavement or from your garage out to the yard or whatever um, you can build one of these things with wheels and if you do build it with wheels, I'd highly recommend that you incorporate some kind of a leveling mechanism. And so as you can see, there's a little jack screw there. There's another one over there. And then way back there in the back, there's a third. And so basically I roll the tripod out here and the mount without the scope on it. And once I get it out here, I go ahead and turn those things and, and level this this whole thing. So that's a that's a pretty neat feature. I'd highly recommend. Uh, 
you know, I'm thinking about building something like that. Um, I'll walk over here before I show you the scope. And this is my setup. Uh, this is a Craftsman plastic bin uh, that I've modified. And this is kind of cool, actually. It's, you can take, if you look in the side there, and you can see the uh, where the holes are drilled. And what I have is I have plastic tie straps uh, holding all that stuff in place. And, you know, I really don't care a whole lot about what it looks like as long as it's not flopping all over the place. So there's a 12-volt power supply right there in the plugs. And then I've got 110 volts up here. And then I've uh, brought all the cables from this loom that goes to the camera, or I'm sorry, to the mount. And I've got another power supply up there. And then I've used this uh, cable conduit. It's like a protective sleeve, the, the red stuff there. And that is really good uh, because it slides over things as the scope is moving. And so that's really important. You don't get cable snags and that. You know, as you can see, I've got like this little thing right there that holds the cable. And then this will literally go up through there and slide uh, as the scope is moving. So anyway, we have the box. You know, I've got a Toughbook CF53 laptop. Uh, I've got this laptop loaded with all the software we'll be using. And then I've got an external monitor here that uh, I really find it nice to use two monitors. I'm just used to doing it that way. I hate working on one monitor and when I've got five programs running at the same time. And I use a mouse. That's another thing. I hate uh, the, uh, the the finger pad there. The mouse just makes it so much nicer to uh, to be able to do what I need to. All right. So moving over to the telescope, we'll see if I can focus. So this is the Skywatcher EQ6 R. I think they call it a Pro. And um, we've got the Edge HD nine and a quarter uh, Schmidt Cassegrain sitting up there. It's got the little uh, finder scope, which I don't use because it's a pain in the neck to look through it. Uh, with, with all this stuff, it's just literally you'll never find a good place to look through that thing. Um, and then up on the front of the scope, you'll see that there are uh, heater strips uh, that are for a DSLR camera. And then up on the very top in front of that Losmondy plate, you can see a couple of wires up there. And those, those come back along that plate to a USB um, power supply right there. It's like a charger. And then there's one little controller that's got kind of some blue uh, on-off switch right there. And then there's actually two uh, the rheostats up there. And each one of those rheostats controls a corresponding uh, heater strip, either number one or number two. I'm going to mark all this stuff so you know, because sometimes you'll be powering them independently uh, to adjust because they, they don't all work consistently. Uh, so it's really important to control your heat so that it's not too hot. Um, you know, keep in mind when you're when you, when you are dealing with dew, you only want to heat your telescope up to the amount that you need uh, to prevent the condensation, which is just a few degrees over the ambient temperature. So you don't have to heat it up to 100 degrees. It's just a few, a few degrees warmer than everything else. And uh, you can measure that with a heat pistol or a, th a thermo pistol, uh, or infrared pistol, whatever you want to call it. Um, you just walk around and check the heat of your mount, your scope, and different things, and then measure your heater strips and uh, control them uh, with that one, you know, however you want to with a real stat or something. The other thing I have for heat down here is a box. Um, I made that out of plastic, actually. Um, I do a lot of just, I don't know, custom fabrication. I, I did it on airplanes and cars and things like that, so... I tend to just make this stuff myself. Um, 
some of these things can be pretty expensive. Uh, you know, a couple hundred bucks, I can go up and make it for, you know, 10 bucks or something in the garage. Anyway, that thing's got a couple of Rhea stats. Um, I actually just uh, drilled a little bit into the plastic and put a little bit of white paint in there so I have some dials, some reference point. And then each one of those you'll see has a digital readout of 5 volts or 12 volts, depending on which circuit you're on. And that will power the 12 volt uh, through your cigarette lighters over there, or it will power USB cables, uh, which can, which are kind of hanging down in there. But it does multiple things, so it, so you can use it for uh, heating. So my camera shut off, so I'm continuing now. But anyway, I, I was telling you about the box, and uh, that's the, <clears throat> it does multiple things uh, in terms of output for the heater. Um, and then we've got the scope uh, itself. Uh, I said it was at Edge HD, and uh, you can see the uh, imaging train here. And the uh, nice thing about this imaging train is I went through this a long time looking at the off-axis guiding option instead of the uh, external guide scope. Um, that GT71, by the way, in there, uh, I, I said I'd used it or I purchased it to put on the Celestron scope, but... Uh, now that I'm not using it, I have a perfect wide field uh, refractor. It's a triplet, uh, so it can do some really nice wide field stuff, and that was the idea. So just keep that in mind when you're buying stuff that um, don't try to try to buy stuff that you can use on something else if it doesn't uh, do exactly what you planned for it. And uh, you know all this stuff uh, you can mix and. Uh, mixed together and, and uh, do different uh, types of uh, astrophotography, for instance, wide field with a mono camera or, you know, uh, really zoomed in with a, a full color camera or the other way around. Um, and uh, once you start collecting stuff, you, you can literally uh, put together different uh, combinations. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're buying your stuff. Uh, so anyway, I went to with the Celestron OAG setup here. Very challenging for many to come up with the backspacing required um, and the prism and uh, guide camera needed to find guide stars. So finding guide stars at 2,350 millimeters is a real challenge. And in order to do that, you'll hear people talking about the prism in the OAG and the sensor uh, pixel size in the guide camera. Those are two really important things to look at. You're looking for uh, large pixels in the guide camera. You're looking for sensitivity in the guide camera. And you're looking for a large prism in the off-axis guider. So um, read up on that. Um, I was really lucky that the... Uh, I'm not using a corrector here. Not that it makes any difference for the back focus, but um, there is a slight improvement actually shooting at the native 2350 instead of uh, shooting with the corrector on the Edge HD. The Edge is already corrected and although you can drop your F down uh, and have a little bit faster scope, so to say, um, I don't see a big um, reason to do that. I, I prefer the power and uh, using the off-axis guiding system that I have on that, I can on this now I can track accurately, so uh, why not shoot at 2350? Um, once you master the, the whole science be, behind the off-axis guiding and you have your imaging train components uh, figured out, then um, you'll, you know, you have the option of shooting full power. It doesn't really make a difference, um, except maybe in light gathering, and it's very slight. Um, I'm using a... Uh, which brings up a, a good point, which is you want a very sensitive main imaging camera. I'm using an ASI 1600 here. I think instead of buying the ASI 2600 that I bought full color, I would have preferred to have gotten the uh, mono version. Uh, but I have the 2600 full color, one shot color, whatever you want to call it, um, so that in uh, certain evenings that uh, where I'm limited on time or just want a quick snapshot of something, uh, galaxies and, and so forth. Uh, I can slap that on here. The other thing about the 2600 is it has a substantially larger field of view uh, compared to the SI 1600 and so it has its benefits there as well. Uh, but this setup here with the uh, shooting at 2350 with, with an ASI 1600 
really get you zoomed into some things and and it's kind of nice for nebula like the eagle nebula the pillars of creation and the uh, bubble nebula and, and then uh, other uh, you know faint objects so or not faint but distance you know extremely small uh, this will give you a pretty good field of view uh, to really zoom into things and you can see Jupiter and the rings on Saturn with this setup as well in live view which is kind of cool uh, so that's the imaging train um, on the Celestron and uh, we'll see how that works here in a little while it's starting to get dark uh, Moose is waiting uh, as usual and he in a little while will start bringing out all his toys and he'll be laying them out here isn't that right Moose? Hey Moose what are you doing? Yeah, what are you doing? You checking it out, huh? You gonna go in the pool? You go swimming tonight? No? Okay. All right, anyway, this is the back. Um, I did this just a little while ago, but the camera shut off, so I'll do it again. This is the uh, swimming pool. That is the north end of the pool, and that is the south end of the pool. And, um, Right up in the sky there is where the Eagle Nebula will be for about two hours. Uh, so we'll be able to get some oxygen and sulfur uh, on the uh, Eagle Nebula. I'm really trying to zoom into the Pillars of Creation. And uh, I've been shooting that in HA for uh, a couple of weeks off and on uh, while I've had the opportunity. Uh, but I've been fighting clouds and haze and seeing conditions haven't been uh, ideal. But uh, I've managed to get a, a couple of good nights out of it. And uh, so I'll continue that on. I, I think right now I'm just uh, I just need to finish it off for this year with the uh, oxygen and sulfur. And uh, once I have that, I'll compile that image uh, together. Anyway, this is uh, this is the yard. I, I uh, again I come out here and I shoot at different locations. So one of the one of the places I shoot most of the winter is over here. So I'll roll the dolly and the scope over here, uh, right up against these stairs, and then I align to the North Star right up there and then I'm able to catch uh, the Milky Way comes literally right over here so all the nebula are coming up from the west over there uh, to the east so I've got north uh, you know west east and south over here obviously I can't shoot the, ne the Eagle Nebula from here uh, because I've got trees in the way, and that's why I put the scope over there on that side. Um, so that's it. Um, and a uh, pretty cool place to be able to do uh, astrophotography. And just so you see the rest of the layout here, this is the rest of the backyard and the garage, the back of the house, and then we've got a forest out of here. Sometimes you'll hear, hear the coyotes back here, which a lot of people don't realize Maryland has coyotes, but uh, I found out one night that we definitely have coyotes because I heard them and then I saw them. So they are here and they're pretty big. They're uh, not the not little uh, guys. They're uh, probably almost the size of moose. They look almost like a wolf. Uh, and they're yipping and yapping. You'd never know that they were coyotes, uh, or even dogs for that matter, because they are all crazy sounding. And that's it. So there you go. I'm going to shut it off, and we'll be back when it's dark. Okay, it's uh, dark in the back, and we're going to do a polar alignment. You can see it's pretty dark over there. I can already see the stars. Um, Jupiter is right up there tonight, and um, let's see if I can zoom into that electronically. I don't know if I can or not, not while the video is running, but uh, anyway, that's Jupiter, and we'll see if we can, there we go, it's a little bit better, and then go over to the north. The banana tree and then I've got Polaris somewhere up there. I 
can't really see it in the, uh, I don't know if I'm not focused or what, but anyway, it's up there, believe me. And uh, so I'm going to set this down and focus it. Got both the screens up. Okay, tonight I've got the screen up, and what we're going to do is we're going to go through the routine of polar alignment using the QHY Pole Master. And um, we're going to see if we can shoot the Eagle Nebula tonight, but before we do, we're going to do a, an alignment. And I'll walk through the software, and then we'll go through the alignment and plate solving on the Eagle Nebula and we'll see how that goes. Um, anyway, I've got it zoomed into the screen uh, that I'm using and so I'm going to bring up the uh, Pole Master software. Again, this is from QHY and the first thing that you will see is it'll bring up the screen for the Pole Master so it basically shows up like this and I like to stretch the screen down so that I can see my sliders um, to center Polaris and then what I'm going to do is this is a height sensitivity camera and the Pole Master camera is mounted uh, with adapters to the EQ6R mount so it comes with a series of adapters um, where the camera basically fits in the opening in the mount um, that the camera or that the uh, the access scope is mounted internally uh, inside the mount. So, in other words, a thing you look through um, with your eyeball, basically, on the back of the mount. So, that way you have a camera uh, up on the front of the mount and it does all the work for you. You could just go ahead and cap off the, uh, the rear uh, eye relief for that and just use the uh, uh, Pull Master software. And what this will do is it will give you precise uh, polar alignment. It's really easy. I'd highly recommend using it. It takes the nightmare out of polar alignment. I see a lot of guys uh, that have problems with this. Uh, you know, in particular, it's one of the biggest things that they uh, have issues with. Uh, mine is focus, um, but, you know, we all have our issues. So, <laughs> anyway, here we go. So, I'm going to go ahead and connect the camera. And as you can see, there's Polaris. It's nice and bright. Uh, I'm going to start uh, the interfacing software, which is uh, Astrophotography Tool. And the reason I'm starting this is because it will bring up my mount. And I'm going to use my mount to do some uh, manual adjustments. Um, and, and then we'll be able to do a couple of exercises you'll see here in a second. Telescope connected. And at the same time, I'm going to go ahead and get my um, camera. I'm going to go ahead and start the cooling on that. Um, I'm not turning on my guiding software right now. So up here, you can see EQ mod <coughs> with the uh, telescope parked. And then I'm going to unpark it. And I'm going to increase the movement to level four, which is, just means it's faster. Um, and I will drop this down now. And I'm going to uh, minimize uh, APT. And so there's Polaris. And um, as you can see, if I squeeze in the screen here, I get the slider right there. And so what it's going to do is it, uh, the first thing it does is make sure, to make sure that your exposure is correct. You can select the exposure and gain up here. Uh, exposure is in milliseconds, and then you have a, a gain number. Uh, that you, I never change these, I just leave it at 50. I, I don't know why actually anybody would want to change those because under all conditions this is satisfactory. So I leave those alone. And it says up here in the, this is the instruction box um, that you follow. It says set the parameters to the left to make sure more stars around Polaris are visible. And I did that. It says double click on Polaris, which is right there. And if you keep your eye on this part right here, it magnifies where my cursor is. So if I go to little stars and things like that around the uh, screen, you'll see that they come into view here. So uh, you'll see that handy in a minute. But I'm going to click on Polaris. I double clicked it. And then you can see there's these circles uh, that show up on the screen. And, and what it says is it says double click Polaris and use the rotate slider on the left. Rotate the template to match up to the stars around Polaris. So this is a way of verifying that you are actually um, on Polaris. And so as I slide the slider, you can see 
that goes by the stars. And you can see this one slightly, um, it's close to the star, but these others aren't. And so you just keep sliding it and it'll rotate around and then all of a sudden you'll see that all those circles actually pick up a star and it's right here. And there's, you can do fine adjustments just by clicking. You can see a little tiny satellite going by right, right there. It's going across the screen. Anyway, um, so I've got a star in each circle. You see a star there, a star here, a star there, a star here, and I've got uh, Polaris in the middle. So I've done that. It says, uh, does match success? Yes. So I click on that. I don't use the old setting that I did last night. It says, choose a star other than Polaris and double click it in the image. Remember this star. Uh, the reason you want to remember it is because you're going to have to keep an eye on it as it moves around a circle here. So I'm going to pick the star way up here. Okay, and it says rotate your mount right ascension axis in the direction indicated by the arrow now at the top of the screen. That's this arrow here. And then rotate a minimum of 30 degrees. And so that's when I bring my mount up and I rotate. Uh, it's always the west button that I use. And you'll hear the mount. And if you notice, the stars are rotating. And that's about 30 degrees. So I stop, I hit finished, and then I double click the same star again, and then uh, rotate again. And so I rotate the mount more. I just actually go all the way to the point where it's horizontal. So right about there. Okay, so the star is still visible over here. Rotate your uh, mounts right axis in the same direction at least 30 degrees okay I just did that so I hit finished and then it says double click the same star so I double click the same star again there and it drew this circle right and so I could barely see the star it's right it's right there it's, if you look up here you can see it um, just hidden behind that green line so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hit uh, I'm going to hit park on the mount and it's going to return back to the park position and I'm going to watch that star that it tracks nicely along that green line. If it doesn't track along that green line then something's wrong. Sometimes it's easy to confuse the stars and so you might click on one um, and then lose track and then you're looking at the wrong star and it goes off track off the green line and that's why this is making you do it again. So I'm going to watch it. Um, or actually I should have parked. Shoot. So let me hold on. I got to reset now. So let me park and go back. I hit this. Uh, I hit the button too quick, and so uh, there's no back button at this point. And so basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reset. I'm going to do the same thing. So watch this. So I disconnect, connect. We're going to go through it really fast. That Polaris slider. This is how fast it actually can be. So there. Success. No. Um, double to the star. I use that one. Unpark my mount. I go west again. This is literally how fast it normally takes me. So I'm going really fast here because I, I screwed that one step up. Um, and so I finished, I click the same star again, I rotate again, same direction. And I'm almost horizontal. Okay, and then it says again, I did. And then it says double click the same star. Here's where I got the circle. Okay, now I hit park. Okay, watch that star now. You can see it right there. See it tracking nicely along that circle? That's what you want. There it is right there. Up in the upper left of the screen as it's moving, I'm following it with the cursor and you can see it's right on that line. There it goes right there. All the way. Okay, and now we're parked. So it was correct. It tracked, so I hit correct. Um, and I'm not going to use my mount anymore, so I'm going to make that go away. And then I double click Polaris and you can see, now this is pretty darn close, but um, you can see where it wants me to be centered, which is 
um, where the rotating circle is. Um, and I'm literally almost there. And that's kind of funny because I, I had the mount in the house and I pulled it out here and jacked it up and pointed it in the direction that I normally point it. And I just happened to be really close. So that's good. Um, so it says double click Polaris and use the rotate slider mount. Okay, so I did just to make sure. Success. It says using your altitude and azimuth bolt to move Polaris into the center of the small rotating circle now shown on the image. So I'm going to put my cursor over the rotating image or the rotating cursor so you can see as they make these adjustments. So this is where you go to your mount and you do the manual um, adjustments. And I'm still recording. So we'll bring it in. So it's going to come down a little bit. Okay, you see it drop down uh, almost to the middle. When you do this, don't uh, don't lean on the mount and don't uh, don't pressure it, so you won't um, throw it off you when you let go of your bolts. So there, it's pretty close. You can see I've got so Polaris uh, in the uh, crosshair right there in the upper left, and it and it says finish. Double click Polaris, use the rotate slider on the left. So it's going to show me the circles again to verify. There they are, so that's good. And then it says, please click the star monitor, star monitor. Okay, now it wants me to align the red and the green. So the, it says, use your altitude and azimuth bolts only to move the pole rectangle on top of the access circle. So the pole rectangle is green and the access circle is red. And so here I'm zoomed in and you can see it's almost dead center. I just have a very slight amount of vertical that I need to bring the axis circle up. Okay, so I'm going to bring the axis circle up slightly. Whoops. Very so slightly. Pretty close. And then a slight adjustment on my bolts. Okay, there we go. That was the azimuth, so that was a slight down with the um, with the altitude and a, a slight amount with the azimuth. And as you can see, we are dead center. So that's it. That's done. That's how QHY Pole Master works. Now I can go ahead and slew to the target and all sorts of videos.